Okay, uh, let's get started. So uh, before I start the lecture, uh, there was a typo in the homework on the due date. Uh, the due date is a week from today. Uh, that's Friday, March 19th. Um, so uh, I hope you've already got started on it. Like I said, it's a harder problem set than usual. Uh, I believe there were some materials you need for it that uh, Ryan covered in section yesterday. Uh, so if you missed that, you can access the recording, I presume. Um, <clears throat> and you'll have another section, of course, on Thursday, but don't wait until then <laughs> to get started on it. All right. Um, <clears throat> so last time we, you know, the starting point of last lecture was the, was the claim that the defining property of a superconductor in BCS theory and more generally of every superconductor we know uh, is the presence of uh, this kind of long range order where you look at the, you annihilate a Cooper pair, a pair of electrons at one point and then you put it back in uh, far away. Uh, and this process happens with uh, essentially there's some coherence in the pair wave function in the ground state. And because of that coherence, uh, this correlation function doesn't decay to zero, decays to a non-zero constant. Uh, and you have then this order parameter psi naught, which is non-zero locally in space. Okay. Uh, and then what we showed last time was <clears throat> uh, just from this assumption of long range order and a few simple hand-waving arguments, uh, you could write down a uh, uh, a theory for the fluctuations of this order parameter, at least the phase of the order parameter, uh, phase theta, uh, and that had a helicity modulus or something like a shear modulus associated with twists of theta. Uh, and from that shear modulus, uh, the helicity modulus, you could then predict superconductivity, you could predict the Meissner effect. Uh, and in fact, there's a direct relationship involving only fundamental constants of nature between rho sub s, the velocity modulus, and the Lernan penetration depth, which is definitely measurable uh, in experiments. Um, so on the theoretical side, you have to compute rho sub s, uh, and that can be done using the Kubo formula, as it's worked out in the book. Uh, but today I'll do it by another method, a simpler method but that works uh, at least near TC, the critical temperature. Uh, using what's called the Landau Ginsburg theory. Uh, but before I get started on that, any questions? Okay, so what the Landau Ginsburg theory, uh, you know, it was quite a landmark when it came out and I believe it was proposed actually even before the BCS theory, just on some general criterion. Uh, and, uh, it is a landmark because it it showed, you know, for the first time how uh, you could introduce uh, what we now call an order parameter for an electronic system uh, and write down a theory for them, which is expressed only in terms of the order parameter. So now we want to think of psi sub c as our fundamental object, not the electrons, because that's what's controlling at least some aspect of the physics in the superconductor. Uh, and so we want to uh, get rid of the electrons and change variables, if you wish, to a bosonic field, uh, size sub zero of, of the Cooper pairs. Now, actually in general, that's a very complicated task. It can't really be done in any consistent way. Uh, but what Landau and Ginsburg showed, it could be done quite reliably uh, near the critical temperature. So we're not going to go to finite temperature, uh, and uh, go to near TC. And near TC, we can, you know, basically the rule is at finite temperature, uh, fermions don't matter that much and you can forget about the uh, electrons and everything can be written in terms of uh, psi sub C. Now in principle, you know, what Landau and Ginsburg are doing is not more than BCS because BCS can also go to, you know, finite temperature, it can also describe spatial variations. Uh, uh, of the order parameter by just putting in a wave function that has some spatial variation. Uh, but the BCS theory is very hard to work with. Uh, and in particular, once you apply a magnetic field, it's almost impossible to work with, except using big computers or something like that. Uh, 
But the land Augensburg theory, the beauty of it is that it immediately allows you to work even in the magnetic field. Uh, and it, what it led to was some remarkable predictions, theoretical predictions uh, by Abrikosov uh, of the existence of uh, vortices with quantized flux uh, and of the existence of a new space of matter now called a type two superconductor uh, where you have a lattice of vortices. Now, a lot of that we won't, I'm not going to cover. Uh, that would take you to some superconductivity books, but I will at least set the framework for, for these predictions. Okay, so let's go to the next chapter then on landau Gitzburg theory. Uh, so as I said, the idea here is to make a change of variables from the electrons uh, to some Cooper pair operator. Uh, and the basic technical trick uh, I'm going to use is called the hubbard stratonovich transformation. Uh, of course, this is not how Landau and Ginsburg did it. They kind of just guessed the answer. Uh, and then BCS theory came around and then very quickly Gorkov showed that you could derive the landau Ginsburg theory from, uh, 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 from, from the BCS theory uh, using a method uh, that's not so far from what I'm going to use here, but this is how we think about it today. Okay. Uh, this is a little cleaner and more general. So we start with some simple model for a superconductor. Uh, I'm going to put the system on a lattice now uh, with some dispersion EK. Uh, and I, instead of taking this complicated BCS interaction with this omega Debye, I'll just say, okay, let's imagine that there's a attractive interaction for some reason on site between the electrons. So there's some negative U, that's called the Hubbard model with a negative U. Uh, which is completely on site, all on the same side, opposite spin electrons gain in energy, yeah, negative view. Now in reality, opposite spin electrons repel each other on the same side. Uh, so this is just some kind of effective model. You can think of each side as some grain, if you wish. So you're taking some uh, granular superconductor. Each grain, basically you imagine has only a very small number of charge fluctuations. Uh, and so on that grain, uh, there's a net attractive interaction uh, between the electrons. Okay. But it's just, just a simplified model. I mean, you could equally well work with the ECS model, uh, but just make life simpler to work with this model. Okay, what we want to do is evaluate the partition function of this model. Uh, so we want to evaluate this and by the usual time order perturbation theory, it's given by the expectation value in Z naught, where Z naught is the free particle Hamiltonian uh, of the interaction term uh, in the interaction representation. H1 is the interaction term and it's the interaction representation because the hat means the time evolution uh, is due to just the free particles. So this is what we want to evaluate, the time order expectation value. So if you write this in, this is, you know, got four fermions in there, all these Cs will go in here. All right, so now I introduced the Hubbard-Sutanovic trick uh, on this. So this is a, still a, quite a bit of a mess. All we've done so far is just expand this in powers of U. Uh, and we don't want to do that because uh, as we learned that there's a effect that's E to the minus one over lambda where lambda is supposed to U, that's the essential singularity as U goes to zero. And that you're certainly not going to describe. You just started expanding this in Feynman graphs, uh, just without, you know, as you have done so far. So we want to do better. So the basic trick, which actually can also be applied to ferromagnetism, although we didn't use it there, is just a simple uh, integral identity. So Z is some complex number and you integrate over the entire complex plane uh, of this function of Z. Uh, a is a positive real number, so that this thing is well-defined. It converges as Z goes to infinity, and there's some linear function of Z. Um, so now what you can do is you can just complete the square. And if you complete the square and then shift uh, variable Z, you'll get back the same integral after completing the square. So this is complete square and shift, you'll get the same thing, but you'll get an extra factor left over from completing the square, uh, and that's this factor over here. Okay, this is mod size squared over eight. So this is the basic identity that I'm going to, we're going to use over and over and over again. Okay, so what, how are we going to apply it? 
well, the z here, uh, I'm going to take to be uh, this operator here, uh, ci up, ci down, that's going to be equal to z. So this is going to be an example of our z. Okay, so uh, you might be a little worried about how, you know, this z is a number and this is an operator. Well, um, um, so should I worry about the fact that this doesn't commute? Well, this is where the time ordering symbol helps us. Uh, inside the time ordering symbol, if everything effectively computes, as long as I keep the time ordering intact, it doesn't matter what order I wrote, write it, it's all taken care of by this, this object here. So really it's as simple as that. So I can just forget about the fact that this may not exactly commute with that. Uh, so just think of it as some complex number. So this is a complex number now defined at every site i. So I have, and then for every time tau. So I imagine I discretize time a little bit. I put lots of d taus. Uh, so time is discrete and I have a whole bunch of times and a whole bunch of sites. For, for every time tau and every site i, I apply the same identity over and over and over again. So I do it infinite number of times. Oh, okay. And then what happens now this mod z squared now, um, is exactly this object. Uh, A becomes minus U, well, minus because there's, but there's an additional minus sign here. So A becomes just U. Uh, so this A becomes U. Uh, and, I, and I'm actually going to identi apply the identity going backwards this way. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, what am I going to do? Yeah, I start out with this um, and I'm going to write it uh, I'm going to take this on this side here uh, and apply the identity over and over again. So Z is a complex, uh, sorry. Psi is a complex number. So Z is going to be integrated over, uh, at least on this side. Uh, maybe I should just write this out again. <laughs> Too many words. So what I'm going to say is that, uh, uh, let me not, yeah, let me get rid of all the integrals. So I'm going to write exponential. U, C dagger up, see, I drop all the time inside indices. Uh -huh. This is going to be equal to uh, DZ, uh, no, D psi. Of exponential of minus mod psi squared over u, that's this factor here. Uh, and then I'm going to get uh, plus or minus, what did I take? Uh, minus, minus psi c, psi, psi c dagger up, c dagger down, minus psi star, c down, c up, something like that. So this is just another version of this identity here uh, with some overall normalization constant uh, that I don't worry about so much. There's a number here, which is this number value of this integral, which is just a number as far as I'm concerned and since it doesn't involve uh, um, Sorry, this is confusing, isn't it? <laughs> uh, have I written it the right way as I have? Okay. Um, Yeah, so this is, Z is like psi, you know, no. Yeah, this is very confusing. I think it, I don't think I wrote it the correct way. Uh, psi is like this, not Z. I, got, I had the wrong way around. Z is like psi and psi is like C up, C down. I'm sorry about that. Uh, anyway, so I should, I should correct this and just interchange psi and Z in this identity here. Anyway, this is the identity, which you can uh, check for yourself. Uh, and so you apply that identity over and over again. Uh, just so, so let me just to, to just at least make the statement once and for all. Uh, we're going to use this identity where psi uh, is going to equal to c up, c down, and z is what I call psi. Sorry for that confusion. 
Okay, so if you apply that identity to this object here, you get the psi squared over u, you can integral over psi, and then you get the time ordered exponential of psi times c dagger c dagger and psi star times c c. Okay. All right, so finally, uh, I just imagine that I can evaluate this object, which I in general can't, this object I evaluate and take it, make a log of it and put it up there. So then I can write this um, as like a stat mech problem. So in my stat mech problem is now defined uh, in space time. So it's really like a path integral. Uh, on each side I, I have a complex number, which is a function of time. So that's my path integral over complex numbers, one on each side uh, I. And then there's some action. So if this was the Feynman path integral, there'd be some action of the kinetic energy uh, plus potential energy, uh, at least in imaginary time. Uh, and so there's an action here, and the only trouble is this action is now extremely complicated, functional of psi. It only depends on psi, uh, and this is the action functional. It involves us evaluating this horrible object, uh, but at least the, this object is evaluated uh, for free electrons. So it has terms to all order, some time ordered expectation value that I need to evaluate. Actually, if psi is a constant, this is not so difficult to evaluate exactly. But if psi is an arbitrary function of time, then, then there's no way to do this exactly. Okay. All right, so I have some functional of, of, uh, of psi. And now my theory is just a path integral over psi. And in fact, the physical interpretation of psi is also very simple. Uh, it's, you can see it's conjugate to the Cooper pair operator. So we can basically think of it as the Cooper pair operator because every time you take a derivative respect to psi, you pull down a Cooper pair operator. So correlation functions of psi will be modulo some additive terms, just correlation functions of the Cooper pair operator. Uh, so I've got now what I needed. I, I have a theory uh, for the Cooper pairs, which are not really bosons because this is not the action for free, you know, weakly interacting bosons but it's a bosonic field anyway, uh, in the sense that it, uh, it doesn't anti-commute when two points are far apart. Um, uh, and the action for this Cooper pair field uh, is very complicated. It's nothing like canonical boson, it's something that involves knowing a lot about the electrons, the free electrons, which in fact will form a Fermi surface in H0. All right, so this is, uh, just a formal manipulation. It's just a rewriting of the path integral. Uh, and it's in fact, usually not useful, especially at low temperatures. But it turns out to be remarkably useful near the critical temperature. So we're going to go to finite temperature. So quantum effects become weaker. Uh, uh, and we're going to approach the critical temperature where the superconducting order parameter is very weak. It's going to zero. Uh, so you want to be near the critical temperature. You could be a little bit above it, a little bit below it, but the superconducting order parameter size in, in some sense almost about to vanish. So when it's about to vanish, and this was the key argument that Landau Ginzburg also made based on some symmetry, they didn't actually have this particular model to work with. They said, uh, well, if it's about to vanish, and then this, let's take this action and just and uh, evaluate it in powers of psi. Okay, so let's just go uh, and expand this whole thing in powers of psi. And that's what we're gonna do now. Uh, and the question is how many powers should you keep? You know, will you get sensible answers when you expand in powers of psi? And notice, you know, this is not the same thing as expanding in powers of u. You don't want to expand in powers of u. That would just be perturbation theory that we have learned about. Uh, and you will notice, of course, u appears in the denominator as one over u. So that's telling you that, in fact, you're doing something very different. Uh, small psi is not the same as small u. Uh, so we're going to expand in power of psi and see what we get. Okay. Um, all right. So how far do we go? It turns out, first of all, you can see just by symmetry. Uh, because you have to conserve numbers of particles. Every time there's a psi, there should be another psi star. Uh, otherwise, you get a correlation function that doesn't conserve number of particles in the free particle Hamiltonian. 
and that's not allowed. Uh, so it has to have, in fact, only depends on mod size squared. It can't depend on psi and psi star separately. Uh, and so how many terms you need? Well, let's say we go to, it, the first term is mod psi squared, the second term will be mod psi fourth, and that turns out to be sufficient. You have to go to order psi to the fourth. Okay, so we're going to expand this action near, t, near TC and powers of psi. So what is the first term? Well, if you just look at this, this is exactly what you did when we did uh, develop diagrams. You were taking time-ordered expectation values of something, of the exponentials of something, expanding it in powers, and using Wick's theorem. Uh, and then you were taking only connected diagrams, and that told you that uh, you, you know, for the free energy, that actually turns out to be equivalent to taking the log, although to this order, we don't even have to worry about that. So what is the first non-trivial term that comes from here? You take this to second order, you get psi c dagger psi, c dagger, and you get psi c c. So I can write that in pictures. So what I will get, you know, I have a psi here, and that creates a c dagger c dagger, and c dagger c dagger we know are lines like this. And then I have another psi star here, which multiplies c c. So this gives you lines going out lines going in and you just connect them up. So this is the graph that you have to evaluate. Uh, it's very much like the, the, the uh, Lindhardt function that we evaluated for the dielectric constant with one extremely important difference, which makes all the difference in the world, uh, is that these arrows are in the same direction. So it's what's called a particle, particle bubble, not a particle hole bubble. Uh, you create a pair of particles and then you annihilate them. And it's a propagator for a pair of particles uh, in the, in the, for the free electron gas, okay? Uh, and so this term is what we, I've called here P of K and omega N. So we're gonna do this all in imaginary time is equal to this graph. So momentum K and omega N are coming in. Uh, so let's say this graph has momentum P and frequency epsilon n. So then, uh, okay, uh, this should be all right, sorry. So then this thing, uh, well, yeah, I don't know what I did there. So this thing should have momentum p plus k and epsilon n plus omega n. Okay, I, I put p minus k and minus epsilon n, but we can fix that. Uh, oh no, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. Uh, let me get this right. Okay, so no, this is a, this is of course I was forgetting myself the arrows. Uh, so this um, this thing has momentum p going here. This thing has momentum k coming in. So what's left to go this way? Now, if this is a particle hole ladder, it'd be just k, but no, it's p has gone out and k is coming in. So that should be k minus p. Uh, and how much frequency is there? Well, you send in omega and epsilon n went this way. So that must have frequency omega n minus epsilon n, not plus. Okay, and that simply has to do with the fact that these things, these arrows point the same way. So, you know, there's water coming in in a pipe and then it splits into two, both going the same way. In the particle hole thing, one pipe was coming in and the other pipe is going out. Here, both pipes are going out. Okay. And, and so now you put in the Green's function and then you get this here. Uh, and, uh, okay, I think I made some different choices here. Mm, all right, two. I don't know. Okay, there's, there's some typos here I have to fix. Uh, I guess what I would I would write down is what I have up here, which would be one over uh, I epsilon n minus EP and one over I omega n minus EN uh, minus EK minus P. Yeah. Okay, I'll fix that in this uh, in the and I'll pull it after class. Uh, that's what this should be. 
Uh, and then you do separate by partial fractions and you do the summation like you've already learned how to do. And this is the answer that you get. And this I'm pretty sure is right. Okay. So it's very much like the Lindhardt function, uh, but with some small differences, which make its behavior totally different. Uh, one is in the Lindhardt function, you had f of EP minus f of EP minus K. Here you have f plus f and the whole thing subtract. I think the sound is off. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, now it's okay. Sorry about that. Um, so what, uh, when did I, uh, when, did, when, did I, when did you stop hearing me? Uh, like 30 seconds ago. Oh, okay, fine. Thank you for alerting me right away. Uh, okay. Um, all right, so we need to evaluate this. I, I, so I was saying we've got this uh, expression for P of K and omega. Uh, which appears in the psi squared expansion of the gens lindau gisberg functional. Uh, we need to evaluate this as small k and small omega. Uh, and so we just put k and omega equals zero and you get this expression here. Okay. Uh, so this comes from just evaluating this bubble bubble, this particle particle bubble. Okay, now you the usual tricks, you convert this to an integral over energies. Uh, you know, so this thing is exactly equal to, without approximation, is integral dE of the density of states, dE times one minus F, two F of E over two E. So that's exact. And then, then you say that, well, let's assume it's dominated by the proximity to the Fermi level. Uh, uh, and so you pull the D of E out just to make life a little simpler, just focus on the physics near the Fermi level. You pull the D of E out here, put it D of zero. Uh, and then you put some cutoff lambda, which is off the range of, so in the BCS theory, that was the Debye frequency. Here it will be off the order of the Fermi energy. Uh, in the end, this cutoff disappears from our final expression. So it doesn't matter so much. Okay. So now if I take this expression, uh, what do I see then at zero frequency at zero momentum? So then my, what I see is that I have my landau ginzburg functional. Uh, so my landau ginzburg functional, S, and I'm only frequency uh, S of psi, it's a zero frequency and zero momentum. So it's equal to, uh, it has a mod psi squared. It's only a function of psi because there is no frequency or momentum. Uh, one minus u, uh, and what I had was p of zero, zero. Uh, plus there'll be higher order terms. And what is this term? Psi squared is one minus u minus, and now I have this expression right here. It's the density of states times minus e to e, minus lambda to lambda, dE over e. And this one minus f is like tanch, tanch of. Uh, 
Okay. So now if you look at this, uh, this should ring some alarm bells. This is an expression we have seen before. Uh, so let me see if I can find it. In the DCS theory, uh, you know, we had it uh, right here when we computed TC. Uh, here it is, the same, exactly the same expression is DE over E tangent epsilon over 2T. There it was. And when this was equal to one over lambda, that was the equation for TC. So here we see that uh, this tells us that this thing, if I put this equal to zero, uh, then, uh, then I get an equation for TC as before. It's the same equation I had before. So the way this is usually written, and which we're going to write in a few minutes, we say the action functional is some constant we call alpha alpha psi squared, and the next term is psi to the fourth, we call it beta, psi to the fourth, and that's it. Uh, and alpha uh, is greater than zero for t greater than tc, and it's equal to zero, t equals tc, and alpha is less than zero for t less than tc. Uh, and so, and we, not, we, we are free to choose the normalization of psi, which I will choose a little bit. So normally, so we choose to write it this way, right? This is how it's written mostly, is T minus TC over TC. So we're going to be near TC, so we just take the linear function of TC, uh, and then this gives me what this is. So this coefficient alpha is just some function which measures the deviation from criticality in dimensionless units from the critical temperature. Okay, so that's what I'd be very nicely get from our calculation of P of zero, zero. Okay, so that's something we could have guessed, you know, but, but now we want to do more. We want to get not just uh, the zero frequency and momentum term. Uh, we also want to get beta, for example. We want to get uh, this beta. Uh, and to get the beta, you have to, uh, expand this whole expression here to fourth order in psi. And that's also not too bad. You can do it by diagrams. But before I get there, let's also look at the k and omega dependence of this. So we computed p of zero, zero. Let's compute uh, p for small k and small omega. All right, so this is done here in some detail and it involves, you know, I mean, it's just algebra at this point or simple calculus. You have the expression here for all P and K. You just have to expand it out and for small omega and small K and see what happens. So I won't go through all that algebra. It's in, I have spelled it out and worked it out. Uh, what you find is that in omega, in terms of omega, uh, the leading correction is something very peculiar. It's mod of omega. Uh, in imaginary frequency divided by temperature. Okay. And the expansion in powers of K is quite regular. Uh, and if you do it, you get something like this. So this is what it looks like at small K and omega. There's a mod omega over T, and then there's a VF squared, K squared over T squared, and C is just some dimensionless number of order one that would depend on the Fermi surface that I don't compute. Okay. So this, both of these terms are going to be very important for us. Uh, what this term does, it tells you that there's some energy cost for spatial, for, which depends on the momentum. Or after you take a Fourier transform, this is giving you energy cost for uh, variations in, in psi, spatial variations in psi. So what are spatial variations in psi? Well, one of the spatial variations in psi is the variation theta, the angle theta, the phase of the superconductor. So we're going to see in a few minutes that this is going to give us the value of rho s. This is what's going to determine this mysterious helicity modulus, this, this thing over here. Um, what about the frequency dependence? Well, frequency dependence have to do with uh, uh, you know, time evolution. And if this was a Bose gas, you know, you, you get a like a linear and time derivative, but you know that if I take, take a time derivative, uh, the Fourier transform that uh, is actually uh, 
uh, Fourier transform of a time derivative is I omega, not mod omega. Uh, so what this mod omega term corresponds to uh, is not ordinary time evolution. It corresponds to dissipation. It corresponds to a friction uh, or decay. And the decay here as a Cooper pair can decay into particle hole pairs near the Fermi surface. Uh, and this decay gives you some damping on the time evolution uh, of the superconducting order parameter. So we get some very useful information on the time dependence of superconductivity, uh, which is also important for experiments. Okay, so those are the two terms here. And then finally, we determine the psi fourth term. Uh, and this involves four powers of psi, but it's, it's really quite easy to figure out with diagrams. So you have a psi here with a C dagger, C dagger. Uh, and then I'm going to put a psi star here with a CC, and another psi star here with a CC, and a psi here with a C dagger, C dagger. And with these four, you have to draw something that's connected, otherwise, it will just drop out of the Exponent uh, of the logarithm, and the, the only connected diagram you can draw uh, is this one. So it's a a box diagram or a diamond diagram. Particles going this way, um, and so now you have to evaluate it. It's very similar to the evaluation of the bubble diagram, uh, except that you have four Green's functions now, uh, not two. Uh, in general, this is a huge mess. I wouldn't ask you to evaluate this but if you take we're only interested in the in the constant side of the fourth term it turns out so you can take all the external vertices to have zero momentum and if you do that you just simply get uh you know if all the external vertices have zero momentum then if there's frequency omega here uh, and momentum k this must be frequency uh since uh this must be omega and k again by conservation of frequency now there's zero momentum coming in, this should be minus omega minus k, and this should be minus omega minus k. Uh, so there's just four powers of i omega minus k, but some of them with a minus sign, and you put them all together, uh, you just get this, this very simple expression, which you can evaluate, and there's, there's what it is in terms of the density of states. It has, turns out to have the zeta function in the evaluation of the frequency summation. I'll let you play with that, mathematically I can do it, uh, how to do that summation. All right, so now collecting everything. Sabir, can uh, I ask yes. one question? Yes, please. Um, what is the physical reason why we're considering quantum values of K and expanding around it? What is the reason, sorry, again? Uh, to consider small values of K, of momentum. Because we're just going to look at long wavelength uh, physics. I, I see, so it's just, yeah. okay, that works. In the end, what really justifies is that the size of a Cooper pair is much longer than the size of the electron, uh, uh, the spacing between the electrons. The Cooper pairs are very big uh, because the pairing is very weak. There's only weakly bound pairs of electrons. Uh, and because of the large size of the Cooper pairs, on the natural scale uh, of the superconductivity, the k's are quite small. The k that we're interested in ultimately are much smaller than the Fermi surface, Fermi momentum. Uh, and those are the important k's, it turns out. And so you, it's quite safe to expand it. Now, you know, the other thing you might wonder is what about in the site of the fourth term? Why I'm not expanding here? I'm just keeping here k equals zero. Uh, the point is they're a little more important in the psi squared term because in the psi squared term, you know, we saw that this alpha vanishes near TC, it becomes very small. So when alpha becomes very small, I do have to worry about the gradient terms here. This beta never becomes very small, it's about a one. So the fact that there's some small k correction here doesn't matter. So we can just take beta to be a constant. All right, so, so now let me forget the omega dependence for now uh, and just rewrite everything. So I collect all the results I've gotten. Uh, I did the Bahabur Stratonovich transformation. I expanded powers of psi. I uh, evaluated some Feynman bubble graphs. Uh, what have I got? And I ignore, I put everything at zero frequency. So what have I got? What I've got uh, is 
a classical statmec problem. So the classical statmec problem, where my degrees of freedom is a complex field psi at every point in space. So I have to integrate over this field. And then I have some free energy for the fluctuations of that field. And what is that free energy? Well, I can take the k-dependent term and write it as d times grad psi squared. Uh, and and uh, alpha uh, and the alpha psi squared I already told you about. Uh, and I'm not going to call this beta tilde, so I should have done that beta tilde here too. Uh, reason being uh, that, unfortunately, these are both standard conventions. You've used beta for temp inverse temperature. And I don't want to confuse with the inverse temperature. So in this chapter, I'm not using beta for inverse temperature, uh, but I'll, in the previous chapters I have, so I don't want any confusion. That's why I call it beta tilde. Okay, so this is what you get. Uh, and uh, all the results we have so far, you can just play with it. And I've also rescaled psi by a factor of the dense square root of the density of states. Uh, you put it all together, you get these from BCS theory, you get precise predictions for what's the value of alpha, what's the value of beta, what's the value of d. D is this coefficient here. And notice here, uh, in all of the expressions, except the expression for alpha, I've replaced temperature by Tc. It's only in alpha that the difference of T minus Tc matters. Everywhere else, you know, these are numbers of order one. So whether it's Tc or 10% greater than Tc shouldn't matter. So we just replace T by TC since you assume we are close to TC. Okay, so we have the precise predictions for alpha, beta, and D. And, and this is the Ginsburg Landau theory in its simplest form. Uh, so in fact, Ginsburg and Landau just wrote it down by guesswork. Uh, they did the BCS theory didn't exist. Uh, they just wrote it down. Uh, and they had no idea what D and alpha and beta were. And then Gorkov showed, well, I can use the BC once the BCS theory came out, Gorkov put it all together and gave these values for alpha, beta, and D. Okay, so we've done what Gorkov did, and we've also derived the Ginsburg Landau functional uh, just from this uh, from the BCS theory with these with actual numbers for these coefficients. Okay. So now we can uh, now we have no now we can turn into statmec people. We can say, all right, forget about quantum physics. Uh, we just have a purely well-defined statmec problem defined by uh, by these two, uh, but by this free energy functional. And you can see this is nothing but some continuum limit of an x y model. If you have seen statmec x y models, sometimes called five fold field theory with two components. Uh, but originally, it was the ginsburg landau theory of a superconductor. Okay, we're not going to do anything fancy with this. Uh, because what happens right near TC, you really have to do the whole path integral. Uh, and that's the theory of critical phenomena. That's not the subject of this course. Uh, but we just treat this free, of free energy uh, in the, uh, the saddle point approximation. All we do is just minimize this for free energy. Uh, and the free energy does depend on temperature uh, because alpha depends on temperature. Okay, so what what so this is the you know the usual Mexican hat potential that I think we discussed already in the case of ferromagnets. Same thing here, except it's a complex number. Uh, and so when alpha is negative, the minimum of this quartic term is psi equals square root of minus alpha over beta. Uh, just by minimizing the quantic potential as usual. And now I can uh, get rho s for almost no work because I can say what was rho s due to? Rho s was the energy cost for twisting the phase of the auto parameter. So I take my psi, which is equal to this, and the only thing I do is I twist its phase. So when I twist this phase and plug it in here, this term is going to give me a grad theta squared term. So this is going to become, uh, when I, all, all I do is twist the phase, this term is going to become D times mod psi squared times grad theta squared. 
So I know what psi is. It's minus square root of minus alpha over beta, and alpha is negative. Uh, and I put it all together, and there's my answer for rho s. So if I just take these values, at least near TC, uh, I have an expression for rho s. I notice that rho alpha vanishes linearly as t approaches TC. So rho sub s also, if I plot rho sub s as a function of temperature, here's TC, it comes in linearly here. That's all this can predict. Now, the expressions of the book are really more complete. They involve Kubo formula type calculations that I'm not going to go through, but you can certainly read about in the book. Uh, they, they can tell you rho s at all temperatures, uh, and it comes in in some other function where you have to, and, and this part cannot be determined by these classical considerations. Uh, there you do have to do the full quantum theory. Um, there's also some funny thing called the Ginzburg criterion, which Ginzburg came up with in the, this context, uh, which showed that the saddle point approximation doesn't always, it fails as you approach DC. Uh, and how to treat with that? Well, that of course opened up a whole nother can of worms. Uh, the renormalization group was developed, how to treat the violation of the Ginzburg criterion, that's one way to put it, uh, and the Wilson Fisher fixed point and all of that came a bit later, uh, and uh, that's really the topic of a whole different course. <laughs> but it's all ultimately related to all of these results here. Uh, and uh, also another thing you find in the Ginzburg criterion uh, is that if you look at this number here, it's extremely small. Uh, it's basically vanishes as the ratio of TFCC over EF to the D minus one. Uh, and this tells you that in an ordinary superconductor, you have to be really, really, really close to TC uh, to see any of these fluctuation effects and the violation of the Ginzburg criterion. Uh, and, uh, and the reason that is ultimately related to the fact that TC is much smaller than the fermionin. So superconductors by themselves are, are not such a good place to study uh, critical phenomena, because uh, at least the old superconductors. Uh, because uh, the fluctuation regime is extremely small. Uh, which presumably is why Landau and Ginsburg didn't, uh, didn't worry too much about this and uh, didn't turn up the RG or that came later for other reasons. Okay, uh, that's uh, quite a lot of uh, stuff I covered. Any questions? So basically, the, to summarize, uh, I, you can start from the BCS theory and end up with this uh, basic functional, where the basic physics is the stack mech of a complex field. Uh, and, and you can almost, you know, this, which is what the, the argument of Ginsburg and Landau, or you could just write this down by symmetry. Basically, you write down the most general action uh, consistent with the symmetry of the phase of psi. Uh, uh, this shouldn't matter other than its gradients. Uh, and then there's inversion symmetry, and, and that's pretty much it. So let's, let's give you this uh, result. Okay, any other questions? All right, uh, let me, given the time, I'll come back to this, I'll do this in the opposite order. Let's now talk about the effect of a magnetic field. So how can we put a magnetic field on here? Suppose I did this, I took my superconductor and put a field on it. Uh, well, what you should really do is go back to your BCS theory and put a field on it. And that is extremely hard. Even today, we don't really know how to do that in any tractable manner. Uh, but with the ginzburg landau theory, it's remarkably easy. Uh, it's just a local theory for this uh, Cooper pair autoparameter. Now put a magnetic field on. Well, I can just figure out uh, um, the consequence of the field by gauge invariance. You know, just like I did uh, in the previous chapter. So this is the same argument that I had yes on Wednesday, where I said, you know, we said that, uh, yeah, this is what we said that under a gauge transformation, uh, the Cooper pair operator goes as 
2 times chi, the E over H bar C factor, and theta also has a shift. So this is the transformation of our field psi of the ginsburg landau theory under charge 2. Uh, and so it must be invariant under such transformation where A goes to this. And how do you make that invariant? Well, there's really only one way. And you take the D grad psi squared and you replace the ordinary gradient by the covariant gradient with one very important uh, factor uh, where this charge uh, should be 2E. So that should be 2E. And that's because the Cooper pair has charge 2. And this was actually, you know, of course, Landau Ginsburg knew this gauge invariance argument, uh, but they got it wrong. Uh, in the original paper, they didn't have a 2E here, uh, but they put an E. Or, uh, and that, yeah, so that was the incorrect. Uh, they didn't know about Cooper pairs. Uh, and, you know, once you knew about Cooper pairs on the BCS theory, it was obvious this had to be 2E. And the fact it's a 2E is absolutely crucial uh, because this theory now leads to all kinds of wonderful predictions, including. Uh, uh, the prediction of by Abrikosov of the existence of vortices, uh, and those vortices have quantized flux of h over 2e, not h over e, uh, and that's very much related, in fact, totally connected to this 2e over here. So that 2e is absolutely crucial, it has huge experimental consequences, uh, it can be measured and determines the you know the lattice spacing, you know, Abrikosov flux lattice, and so on. Um, and in the time dimensions, it comes in, you know, the Jolson effect, which we're not uh, discussing here. Okay. Um, so now, and, and of course, I've made a typo here. Sorry. There's a missing factor of A. Somebody should have said that. It looks totally mysterious without the A over there. <laughs> uh, so now, given some A, you can try to minimize this in the presence of an A. Uh, and that's a complicated problem, which Abrikosov of solved for the case of a uniform magnetic field and discovered the average, the, uh, flux lattice solution. Uh, and uh, yeah, so in the end, it just, but everything reduces. You know, there's whole books written. The entire content of the books uh, is basically minimization of this functional in different situations. Uh, it's a complicated applied math problem, but it's conceptually, this is all it is. Uh, and this describes, you know, thousands of experiments uh, on superconductors and magnetic fields, coupled superconductors, you can put in disorder, and then there's, you know, Bogdan-Dijen theory, uh, and so on. <laughs> and if you go back, now you can ask, suppose psi is spatially varying, uh, and you can go back and then solve, resolve the Bogolyubov Hamiltonian in the presence of a spatially varying psi. Uh, then you get all these bizarre things like Majorana fermions and so on and so forth. That all comes out of just solving things that you now know the Ginsburg kind of functional and the Bogolyubov Hamiltonian. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I. I could teach the rest of the course on this, but uh, there's other things that should be covered in this course. I guess there are uh, courses on superconductivity, but sometimes taught where that's done in more detail. Uh, but hopefully I've gotten across um, how the BCS theory leads rather directly to this ginsburg landau theory. Okay. Um, all right. In the few minutes remaining, I'm trying to answer some questions. Uh, let me just come back and just very briefly mention uh, what about this mod omega? Okay. So the mod omega, because there's an I that's missing, what that tells you is that this is really uh, a dissipative term. So this is the, you know, it'll give you Aristotle's equation of motion, uh, which is uh, dx dt is minus 
gamma times the force, not d squared x, dt squared is minus gamma times the force. Uh, so because the i is missing, it's dissipation. Uh, and so, so what happens if you look at this term now, it depends on the time dependence of psi. And in the same classical uh, limit, uh, you can write on an equation of motion for psi now. So that's kind of called the time dependence Ginzburg Landau equation, or TDGL, is a time dependent Ginzburg Landau theory. Uh, and the equation of motion, more generalized from the quadratic term we've gotten, is just this time evolution d psi dt is some minus gamma. So this is the dissipative coefficient, it's the friction times the force, which in this case, the analog of the force is df d star, the derivative of f respect to psi star. So if you linearize these equations, the motion, uh, it is exactly what comes out of the, the action that you have. You just take the saddle point with the frequency dependence and look at what the equation of motion of the saddle point is. Uh, it's exactly this. With, and this gamma is determined by that coefficient of the mod omega term. It just turns out to be just a pure number, 8 over pi times tc. Uh, and then you can also put the time dependence in the nonlinear term. You can put a random noise term to make the whole thing self-consistent. Uh, again, that leads to a much richer piece of physics and then applies also near the critical point, and uh, in which case this becomes what's called model A in the, in the halprin hornbeck theory of dynamic critical phenomena. Uh, anyways, this is without the noise term, this is the TTGL. And also, uh, it's extremely useful. I mean, you could start with the TGL and describe, again, thousands of experiments. Uh, say you have a magnetic field and you make a vortex lattice, and then you put a current through it, and the vortices will move around. Uh, and you know this describes real world physics in a magnet. Uh, when you have, you have a supergravity magnet, and you're looking at how it responds to currents and fields. Uh, and that, in principle, all comes out of just solving this equation. Uh, in that configuration, you know, can be well described by the TDGL. If you get really near the critical point, you have to do better, uh, and that's where the halpern hornberg theory comes in. Okay, so that's just a, a taste of many things uh, that, that lie beyond the subject. We're not, I'm not going to say more about it here. Uh, some of these, if they interest you, this, these could be you know, topics for your presentation, something from uh, all of the topics I mentioned today. Okay, uh, questions? So in the TDGL, everything should be expressed in terms of the free energy? Uh, yeah, so, so the free energy is a functional of psi, and basically you take the same functional, and it's instantaneous. You just take exactly this function now. Uh, so the t is the same. So it's a equal time function. It depends on the value of psi at the same time. But if we're going to add some external perturbation, we just rewrite this free energy? Yes, exactly. Yeah, you figure out how your perturbation couples to psi. Maybe they're impurities. Maybe they're, you know, you can put a magnetic field in here. You have a magnetic field by the, by, by the usual trick of, Covariant gradients, wherever it is, uh, you could put a field in just like that. Yeah, you could take this function out. You could add a potential. You could have a time-dependent field. You know, that's literally. <laughs> it's amazing how widespread uh, uh, that equation is, and how how many experiments it describes. Sure. Thank you. Oh, I have a question, I oh, think. Uh, sure. So, so how this uh, dissipative term in omega relates to uh, to the current, which is usually dissipationless in superconductors? Um, yes, OK. So this is you know, about relaxation of the current. So it's really coming from the decay of the Cooper pair into normal state. So there is some finite resistance in a superconductor also, 
from the normal electron. So there are normal electrons around, oh, okay. uh, and they can also carry current. Now, but of course, you know when you uh, when you're driving a current, you, you uh, what is it? You add the resistance in parallel, not in series. So there is a zero. There's a supercurrent, and then there's a normal current. But the supercurrent shorts it. You know, if they add it in parallel, so the supercurrent. So there's no voltage in the end because there's a shock. All the current will flow via the supercurrent. Oh, I see. So it's like related to th this uh, thing you told us earlier about this, uh, like London equations and uh, two. Uh, how it's called? Like two. yeah. So the London equation is also contained in uh, contained here. Uh, if you just take. Uh, yeah, okay. So I haven't told you how to couple uh, electric field here. Uh, but if basically, if you have a, a spatial gradient of psi, that will give you a current, you know, because psi star grad psi minus psi yeah. grad psi star. So, and that current is a supercurrent. So, that, so this theory, TDGL, has both the supercurrent and the normal uh, dissipative current. That's all included in the same formalism. And this normal current is usually uh, dissipated, right? Yes, yes. Oh. So it's coming from, you know, Cooper pair decaying the two electrons. Yeah, okay, thank you. And that's what this gamma is a measure of, because, you know, it came from the imaginary, if you just look at this graph, roughly speaking, you know, you're injecting a Cooper pair here, and it's, uh, it's injecting Cooper pair decaying the two electrons. So the imaginary part of this is telling you about that decay. And yeah, so I, and in terms of the equations of motion, you know, if you you have a term like this, uh, you know, it's something like psi squared, you get mod omega uh, plus k squared plus alpha, just being very somatic, schematic. Uh, then if I take d by d psi star, uh, this gives the I to do a Fourier transform. Um, and then I, uh, this is an imaginary frequency, then I go from imaginary frequency to real frequency. Uh, I'll just, uh, so there's a gamma here. So I'll get psi gamma d by dt uh, minus grad squared plus alpha times psi equals whatever the cubic terms. And, and this combination here, is exactly what you get. Uh, in fact, that's how you figure out what gamma is uh, by just looking at this equation and keeping f equals psi squared. If you put that in here and you look at this, uh, you get that equation. Yeah, thank you. Um, right. Yeah, so these are you know topics that are really beyond the course, but I couldn't just mentioning them very quickly just to show you, you know, what we have learned, you know, in some sense, what we have learned is up to, up to this point uh, is the starting point of just a vast uh, set of developments in physics that dominated physics in the 60s and 70s and 80s to a little bit. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we have a discussion session tomorrow, but uh, I would like to change to 10 a.m., not 9 a.m., because there's something else going on early tomorrow morning. Uh, all right, so see you tomorrow or Monday. And please do get started on the homework if you haven't already.